My events go year round. Opening a health facility, we will be part of that operations. We will be at the West Las Vegas Library. We will be in Henderson at the, uh, at the Water Street Pavilion. We will have flag raisings, and we've already had flag raisings in Las Vegas, Henderson. Now we're also going to uh, Juneteenth 201, which will take the history from 186 and come forward a few more years. Times have changed, I admit that. Years ago when I first started working, we couldn't even wear a pair of slacks to work. So we started off that you had to, you know, you had to have your toes in your shoes, you couldn't show your toes, you had to have nylons. Uh, agreement called, as I say, the non, uh, the uh, Moulin Rouge Agreement, which eliminated the description, the discrimination. People of African descent were able to go into the casino and gamble. They were able to meet. During the slavery times, you heard about the... <laughs> Hi, Miss G. Welcome. Um, please uh, tell everybody about you. Ah, good. Thank you for having me. Uh, first of all, I am the president and founder of Juneteenth Nevada here in Las Vegas. I am also the, the vice chair of the board of National Juneteenth Observance Foundation and the communications for the National Juneteenth Observance Foundation. And I come from Chicago. I worked two years with the Chicago Group, which is the Coalition for Improved Education in South Shore. And now we are we we have been out here since 2005. So wow. we are we have gotten um, two pieces of legislation passed. We have the recognition of Juneteenth of 2011 observance. And this year, two days ago, we the governor signed the bill for for the Nevada state holiday, which is the 26th state holiday in the country. And of course, we got the bill for the national holiday, which was 475. So we're moving ahead. We have 24 more states to, to obtain uh, state re recognition. And now we're going after uh, commissions. We are looking to get support from the community and, and the government for education, culture, and economics uh, within the state to assist us with our programming wow thank you for everything you're doing there so you are the president of the national Juneteenth observance foundation for nevada do you want to talk a little bit about the, this organization well Please. nevada started off uh, as i say in 2005 i was mentored by reverend ronald v meyer senior who was the founder of the national organization and he taught me how to, to go about and present juneteenth he taught me some of the the basic facts of Juneteenth that I did not know because when I was growing up, very few people actually was taught about Juneteenth. So um, it, it, what you're seeing on the screen now, you, uh, you see the, the per current president and myself in the center there, that's Steve Williams. And if you look over to the right, that is our city hall in Las Vegas. And that is the Juneteenth flag on the city hall building on an electronic screen that they that they will put up for us uh, every weekend. Uh, they had it up last weekend, I believe. They will put it up for us next weekend, and they will put it up on the following weekend. And that is the Juneteenth flag that you can see for for across the country. Wow! So this is a a very good organization where you trying to educate. Um, the public about Juneteenth. So you have the nationaljuneteenth.org, right? Right. As I say, I, we are working, we work both as a local organization and I work also with the national. And um, that, is a, that is a picture that was Miss Opal, who was at the, who was our old, one of our board members uh, that was showing a few seconds ago with the president, uh, June 17th. 2021 when he signed the Juneteenth bill and put it in effect. That is Danny Davis over there on the left side. He is Illinois. He was my, my congressman when I was in Chicago and um, he is still fighting for us. He is currently working on a Buffalo Soldiers bill, which will be placed on the floor actually tomorrow. Uh, there is a Buffalo Soldiers holiday uh, day of observance, which is July 28th. So we go from Juneteenth into uh, the Buffalo Soldiers Day of July 28th, 
but there also there's also a, a bill signed by President Clinton in I believe 1997 or 98 when Bill Clinton signed the bill it covers the uh, honor American days so it covers an entire period from June 14th, Flag Day, uh, past, uh, to all the way to the 4th of July, and Juneteenth is in the middle at June 19th. So for, for 21 days, there should be programming across the country in recognition of the work that we have done to build this country. And they call it Honor America Days. Wow, this is awesome. This is very, uh, very impressive. And... Uh... And you also invited uh, to the White House to celebrate June The national King. group will be at the White House. We will have a stage. We will have speakers. We are scheduled to have Confunction, uh, Funkativity, which is another group. And we will have Bobby Rush. So we, they will all be performing. We will have speakers in between because we are speaking to the young people from that group. That, is called, that, that group is uh, working a program called the Wave of Freedom where we are speaking to the young people in the community to stop the violence. Mm -hmm. So they will, they will be working there under the guidance of our president, uh, Steve Williams. And that's going to be on the ellipse of the White House, which I believe is the area that they have the Christmas tree every year. So we will, we will and that is the first of, of an annual event. We've already got an agreement for next year. We will be back at the White House for next year so people can start their planning. And here in Las Vegas, um, we will have a, we will be in Henderson, Nevada on the 19th. But on the 17th, we have two programs at the West Las Vegas Library. And that, is, that one is uh, Africa to America, uh, the music uh, from the belly of the slave ship, where we're, going, we're talking about the, that particular music program also incorporates messages, but we're teaching the evolution of the music from the drums of Africa coming into the incorporation of the European music in, in uh, New Orleans. And, and we're letting them know that, you know, the call and response, the, the, the uh, verbiage, and, and when you had this, when they were out in the fields, uh, when they were talking about using the, the, the hymns that they were getting ready to run away, you know, hang low. That, that, those were messages. There was messages that, from what I'm told in the braids of the, the young ladies, which was the maps. And there were the um, there were the patchwork quilts, which also had messages woven into the pattern. So we are, we're, we're talking about all that. We're teaching all of that uh, on our national website, uh, nationaljuneteenth.org or nationaljuneteenth hyphen between the national and the, and the Juneteenth. So it's national hyphen Juneteenth. If you will go to that page, you will see something called um, Juneteenth 101. And when you click on there, you will see the story. Uh, you will see things from 1862. If you go into the ribbon in that black section up there, you will see Juneteenth 101. And you can click on that. And there, there when you get to that page, it will let you download information and stories of things that occurred during the Civil War. Or wow. maybe it's not in the black. Maybe it's okay. There you go. So you've got the you've got the one hundred and one. You have the teacher's guide, which gives you more resources, and you have the classroom, which uh, which people. It's an um, environment where you can actually go in and add your information. If you know things that we have not put in there yet, you you can add it to the classroom and share your knowledge. Uh, okay. We have an education group that is working on this that particular project under Dr. Penny Brown. And she has put it together to make it user-friendly. And we, we we recommend that, that as I say, it can be printed out, it can be shared, there is no charge for it. Yes, that is the 101 information. Oh my God, this is so good, wow. And we are, we are working, we are coming forward from that point. Uh, we also have a Juneteenth calendar out this year. The Juneteenth calendar, uh, came out at the beginning of the year, and every day has a different piece of information. You Okay, that was Dr. Myers that you just passed, and uh, the former governor of Alaska. And as I say, the calendar has, 
has information. It gives you, it does not give you all the information. Obviously, the square is not large enough. But it will give it, it. The cover is the flag that you see on the left. And the calendar of 1865 is exactly the same as the 2023 calendar. So in wow. 1865, this date also fell on a Sunday. So it, it's a one for one map. And we are we've already finished most of the 2024 calendar. And it will it will be a, it will be new topics, new information. They're, they're like textbooks that you flip every day and get a new piece of information and get your knowledge, can share it. And you do not get rid of the calendar. You hang on to it because again, it is a textbook almost that will get you started in the history. Wow, this is really good to get started, to get uh, help people learn about Juneteenth. Um, yes. Yeah, I'm glad uh, this is, uh, you have this website. That's, this is great. You talked about um, the, the, the bill uh, for Nevada AB one four zero. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about it. How how did you how you know how what was okay. the process to get there and uh... okay it's a companion bill the original bill uh, was the Senate bill that was passed in twenty twenty one which was S four seven five and that gave you a Juneteenth national holiday with that national holiday it created a paid holiday for federal workers for for uh, postal workers, for people that worked in the government, they received their payment, uh, their paid holiday, their paycheck. State workers could have gotten a day off, but they were not paid. So with a state holiday, uh, we worked, the, the unions backed us, and we went to the assembly. And the assembly only meets every two years for 120 days. And we were fortunate enough to have enough supporters to push the bill through uh, the Assembly and the, and the Nevada Senate, and the bill was signed here by our governor two days ago. And that will give everybody the, the it, it's a companion bill. It follows exactly the same rules as the federal, but now union workers and, and, and custom stores, state workers will now be able to have the day off. They will close state, federal, County, all those offices will now be closed and the employees will be paid for those holidays. We've had the support of the uh, UNLV College uh, from the Nevada State. Uh, we also have support of CSN, which is College of Southern Nevada. Um, and we're working on UNR. UNR has not, has not signed off on us yet. However, the president of UNR was the governor who signed my, my legislation in 2011 to first recognize Juneteenth in the state. So the expectation is they will be coming in shortly. We have the support of uh, committeemen, city councilman, uh, Cedric Creer. We have the county commissioner, William McCurdy II. We have the mayors of North Las Vegas. We have the mayor of uh, Las Vegas and the mayor of Henderson, Nevada, all supporting us for these bills. We're moving ahead. We we have we have great support, and we're we're now working to get a, a new another bill that did not make it this time, but we'll bring it back. We we're asking for an education, culture, and economics commission to help spread the word, help raise the money to to teach the, uh, the people about Juneteenth, which we. And there, there should be a large enough pot where we can help people across the state to get assistance for their programs to teach, hold events for uh, Juneteenth during, throughout the year and uh, through, through uh, the month of June. Now, Juneteenth for us is a year-round project. There are other people that June 20th, they're going June 19th, they have a big event and they do the vending. Uh, they get 5,000 people. My events go year round. So we will, this year, this week, we will be doing, um, opening a health facility. We will be part of that operations. We will be at the West Las Vegas Library. We will be in Henderson at the, uh, at the Water Street Pavilion. We will have flag raisings. And we've already had flag raisings in Las Vegas, Henderson, and uh, the county building. We will have on the 15th, we're going to have a flag raising at North Las Vegas City Hall. 16th, we will be doing one um, 
at the Martin Luther King Senior Center, and we will have one at the West Las Vegas Art Center. So right now we're looking at about seven, maybe eight fl Juneteenth flag raisings, and that's the flag that you've been you're seeing on the screen. Mm -hmm. And it is a copywritten item. So we are the only people who are licensed to sell it. Uh, it, it is, it is um, it was created by Ben Hay, uh, and he still owns the copyright, but we are the ones who are authorized to uh, license it out, to let people use it. If the ones that you see on Amazon, let me tell you, they are bootleg. They're mm -hmm. they they are coming from China. Our flags are made in America. We have them uh, four inches by six inches on, on the sticks, the little hand hand ones for the people that are standing in a parade. You, we have them 14 by 28 inches, which is the what we call the golf size, which is about the size of a car window, or you can hang it from a car door in a parade. We have a three by five foot. We have a six by 10 foot uh, flag. And we can do custom flags uh, coming through our organization we can get you a quote on a custom-made Juneteenth flag. In Chicago, they had one made for 15 feet by 25 feet, and it wow. and it, it it is hanging downtown Chicago. So we can do it from, like, say, from a hand size all the way up to the Picasso statue flag that hangs from from the city hall building down, uh, from the state building downtown. So you talked about the commission. Um, can you? Uh dive deep into that is a commission on education culture and economic um so you're trying to we're building curriculum which is part of that what the 101 is that you showed mm -hmm. we are we're going forward where we did we have the calendar now we are also going to uh juneteenth 201 which mm -hmm. will take the history from 186 and come forward a few more years mm -hmm. and we don't just take people's word for what they what they hear we actually have an education group that that put we pull up the newspapers. We check the story as, as it was written at the time of the event. One of the, the story you, you have heard that you have not heard there's a story of Nance Leggins Costley. She was a slave. She was an enslaved woman, uh, in in Illinois in 1841, 20 years before Lincoln became president. He went to the Supreme Court, got her freedom. She had a little girl and a little boy, uh, no, two girls and a boy. Her son was 10 months old. And when you come forward to 1865, he is one of the 10,000 U.S. colored troops that was in Galveston, Texas, June 19th, 1865. He and two brother-in-laws were present from their, his freedom all the way coming forward to Juneteenth. Juneteenth is not the last day that people receive freedom. It is a day that was selected to represent all the freedom dates. Uh, there are 14 freedom dates in this country that were recognized. But rather, in, in Washington, it's called Emancipation Day. In Mississippi, they call it Ada May Day. Florida has a day. So rather than confuse people, we, we, they selected one date to recognize all the freedom dates. And we celebrate it as a unified organization across the country. So you talked about uh, the bill, um, AB 140. Um, so how many states now recognize Juneteenth as state holidays? Holiday, they all have a state legislation. Some of them have days of observance, which we just came out of. There are 26 state holidays. And some of them are still at the stage where the governor just proclaims it that one year as a Juneteenth holiday. We are now working to get legislation passed in those states to make it year round where it will be recognized, where the story will be told, where there will be proclamations issued to recognize the holiday. Juneteenth is not celebrated either as one particular day. Some people have uh, outdoor events. Some of them have vendors. In our state, we give everything free to the community with no charge. And because of the weather, we are indoors. So even when we did the flag raising at City Hall, we had a program inside of Las Vegas City Hall, but we came outside to raise the flag. In Henderson, we had canopies and ice water and, and, and the cameras, and we did everything outdoors. In the county building, they brought the flag into the county sessions, and it is actually sitting in the county uh, 
County built inside the bill behind the chairs of the legislators. So there are different ways. Very much it's a start off with a prayer. And there are two Juneteenth prayers that we recognize that, that one was written by Dr. Myers. Uh, they, they wrote a Juneteenth prayer. There's another one that you will find on the internet as the Juneteenth prayer. So we will open up the, or we will open up either with that or we will have a minister come in and they will welcome you and say a prayer. Uh, we do the emancipation. We'll, we might talk about the Emancipation Proclamation or the General Order Number Three. We have a Juneteenth anthem, which is a combined national anthem and the Black anthem. There's a, we have had someone who actually was able to follow Dr. Meyer's instructions and combine the two, so they play together in a unified fashion. And then we will. Uh, Lots of the, sometimes there is a proclamation issued from the elected officials to the Juneteenth organization, and we might have a singer, and then the Juneteenth flag is raised, either by a Buffalo soldier. Uh, this year, we, we had Buffalo soldier at one event. We had uh, the Girl Scouts at another event. Now, the U.S. military can come in as a color guard and present the flag, but they are not allowed to raise the flag. So. You know, so, but you can get a, a army veterans, you know, you need two because you do not want the flag to touch the ground. But we have, as I say, the flag is authorized and, and we raise this program and then we close out with, with another prayer. So that is the, pretty much the Juneteenth flag uh, and, and the presentation of it. We have vendors, we have we have networking events where the, where the organizations uh, community organizations get together in addition to our programming. Uh, this year, we will have in, in Las Vegas, the Miss Nevada Juneteenth Scholarship Program, where we will have a young lady, 14 to 18 years old. She will be named as the queen here in Las Vegas. In October, she will be in, in, in New Orleans, and she will meet queens from other cities and states. And they will go for the National Miss Juneteenth Scholarship Program. So in each event, the girls will, will get a, a scholarship at, at different amounts, different states, but it will go towards their education. We work with them to encourage them and enhance what they're doing and their skills as entrepreneurs or where, whatever direction they're going in, uh, into law, in, into uh newspaper writing, wherever they want to go, we support the young ladies. And if they don't make it this year, if they're still with the, in the age range, they can return for next year. Uh, next year, we will be in Atlanta for the event. And in 2025, we will be in Birmingham, Alabama. Now, yeah. in addition to the Miss Juneteenth, we have, as, as I was telling you earlier, the wave of free, uh, no, we will have the music from the belly of the slave ship, Africa to America. Uh, following the trail of the music, uh, starting with the drums in Africa and coming forward and telling of the evolution of the of the music in this country, uh, the combination with the European instruments, uh, the call and response. We will we we teach the children that rap was not started by them. We've been doing rap for a hundred years, and it's just there's a slight variation. There's modernization. But we've we've always had a word in response. We've got spoken word, uh, the Delta Renaissance, uh, where we took what came for Harlem Renaissance, where they did it in New Orleans. And so we, we're teaching them the history of music and hope that they will go forward and learn more about their music. Right. We had an event called um, Juneteenth Arts and Academics. That is a program with right now we're working with five topics. We are, and that's part of the curriculum that we're building and it is expanding where we take it's an after school program where we are teaching the children after school the history of art or the history of the music. Or in, in this year we did we did one in January here in Las Vegas, where it was almost Dr. King Day. So for, for the two weeks we taught the children about civil rights. When they learned about the civil rights, we then brought in people from the, from the different industries to teach them uh, the advancement since the civil rights era. So we tie in the history to the, the present time for all of them. And it was planned as a, as a program for the 10 to 14 year olds. 
but it also brought in the parents who needed some more information, who had learned of what we were doing for the children, and they came in and sat with us. So, you know, and they brought some of the younger children and some of the older ones. So again, that's another one of our, our education programs. Uh, during COVID, we had one we called NEON, where we gave away books and bookcases to encourage the children to build their own book bookshelves, to build their own book collection. They did not have to return the books. So unlike the libraries where you have to, you only have so many days, they get to take these books home. They get to come back for another book. They get to reread the book and, and read it to their younger siblings. So if they get to learn about whatever the story happens to be, you know, so we, we're, we're really into education right now. But we're also teaching uh, fashion uh, with Miss Juneteenth. We're teaching them how to be young ladies, how to speak, how to have etiquette, how to do, to do the public speaking and dress properly, embarrassing themselves or us. You know that we we don't want them with too short. We want something a, a decent length, a decent. Uh, you know, times have changed. I admit that. Years ago, when I first started working, we couldn't even wear a pair of slacks to work. So we started off that you had to, you know, you had to have your toes in your shoes. You couldn't show your toes. You had to have nylons. You had to have a, a skirt. And then then when they finally said, well, you can wear slacks, but you got to have a vest. You got to have a jacket with it. You got to have a suit. And then they came with the hot pants, which was a shorter pant. And then the, everything just kind of disappeared for one point. And I'm not sure exactly what they wear today, but we, we're, also, we're looking to bring back cotillions. We're looking to bring back the longer dresses and, and with the gloves and, and the once a year event where they come out and learn which forks and knife to use have, have the, their fathers or their brothers or someone escort them into a dinner, a once a year big uh, cotillion event where the young men will join them. And we're going forward, we will be, we are developing a program for the young men so that they can now, they can, they can go with, there's a, we're, we're small. We, we need volunteers. We need people who will do our research. We need people to help us with the telephone calls occasionally. As I say, we, Dr. Meyer started this 25 years ago. I have been in Vegas for 20, for 18 years and I did two years in Chicago, you know, but I can pick up the phone and call someone in any state for Juneteenth. Uh, being in the position that I have been in, I can pretty much tell you if you name the state, who the director is, because we have at least one or more representatives in, Los, in, in any state. And they would, if you want to start your own Juneteenth group, we will help you get started. We will help you get the materials. We will work with you to, de to develop. We also go outside of the United States. We do have contacts in Ghana. We have wow. Japan. We That's have great. Mexico. June 19th is also World Sickle Cell Day. World Sickle Cell is, is a disease that affects people of, of the darker race. So it has also been named by the United Nations as a holiday. The June Sickle Cell Day is also June 19th. So we have a combination of that with the Juneteenth events. Uh, Miss Opal does her walk, her two and a half mile walk. As I say, Juneteenth is celebrated and recognized across the country in different fashions, but it is recognized and we're expanding and we're, we're trying to reach those 60 or 70% of the people that know they're off of work, but don't know why. Now we've got to tell them why they're off of work and right. tell them the history that they either never heard or they heard incorrectly. So Juneteenth is a federal holiday, um, several state holidays now. Um, how about private companies? Are they- uh, Private joined? companies, and uh, we have a list of over 700 companies from two years ago that was recognizing Juneteenth. So at this point, I would say we're, you know, we've probably got five thousand. With the holiday, more of the private companies are joining. Go to if you go on Google, you will see us recognized on Google. If you if you look at Apple, you know their their calendars recognize Juneteenth. So we are getting the recognition, but we now we have to fill in the explanation of what they're doing, and we are working with the um, visitors and tourism group here in Las Vegas because. Juneteenth, it can bring people into your city. You know, that we want understood that it's not just on the Strip. 
there's Juneteenth history that goes back to the 40s, to the 50s, where they were not, where people of Americans of African descent were not allowed to be on the strip after dark. They were not allowed to go in the front door. They could not stay in the hotels. They could not eat in the hotels. They could not gamble until uh, March of 1960 at the Moulin Rouge Agreement. They had to go, even the performers, the national performers, such as a Sammy Davis, he had to go back to the west side of Las Vegas to sleep. They did not allow him when he first arrived to sleep in the hotels. So he had to, there were three houses, three houses over there where he would stay in one of them. They said they were, they was to have a midnight show on the west side, which started pulling the Frank Sinatra's and the Dean Martin's off the strip. 1956, we had the Moulin Rouge, but it only lasted six months because they were pulling the, the audience away from the strip. So they closed it up because we were taking to we were taking the, the, the patrons of the strip. And then in 1960, we got the first uh, agreement called, as I say, the non uh, the uh, Moulin Rouge agreement, which eliminated the discrimination where you were a, where the African uh people of African descent were able to go into the casino and gamble. They were able to meet and they were recognized as patrons and full citizens as much as, as, as they could be. I mean, we still have, we don't have shadow slavery that we had before, but you've got the private prison system. So we won't, that's another thing that you go into. We've always had slavery in this world. But the difference between American sl chattel slavery and what you had in Europe, they did not separate their families. Over here, you sep the families were separated. They lost their name. They lost their religion. They, they, they lost their families. So that's something that is now coming together through the DNA. Uh, okay. Additionally, they, they raped the women. They raped the men to, to bring them down. So, so that's how, that's some of the, one of the things that they did to, to, to lower the, the manhood, who, who, who took away the manhood from the, the black men, or they used the whip and they hung them, whatever. They, you know, there were various things that they were doing there. We go forward. We consider Juneteenth a unifier. Yeah. So it last year we had a program F, um, of the Juneteenth powwow, a Juneteenth unity powwow where we had a, a program with the Native Americans, you know, so we brought them all into one of and we wanted to show the, 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 not only the differences, but the things that were alike. We wanted to show that the Indian fry bread and, and, and the, the hush puppies of, of, the, of the South were similar. We wanted to talk about the differences between the African drums where uh, there were hand drums with one person on them and the Indian drums where they had four or five people playing one big drum. Mm -hmm. uh, we talk about the jewelry. We talk about the artwork, the colors that you will find in the two communities. So this is something that we did last year to unify. And we brought in the Buffalo Soldiers, which are the descendant group from the U.S. Color Troop. They, we brought them on stage and they had they shook hands with the Native American representative. You know, the, the, it, it was symbolic. But again, we're unifiers. We're not just black black matters or anything like that. We're not out there fighting. We're not protesting. We lived through that with civil rights. So what we're doing now, we're we're a little bit a little bit older in many cases, and we we can we we go legislation. We go you know we we talk to people. We teach them, and again, wave of freedom again. We'll be teaching, trying to teach the young children, or the young people, not to be fighting to get rid of the violence. We would like to see some of them go back to the yes, we want it, we want folks to have a college degree, but not everybody is a college person. Yeah. So in the cases where someone is good with their hands, with their skills, know how to how to be a carver, let them be a carver. Let them do what they do best. And that's Juneteenth, bringing your best to the table and going forward with it and sharing it with others. Yeah, it's all about love. It's all about teaching love. Uh, bringing people together. So uh, that's a great segue on Juneteenth. So Juneteenth, for someone out there who don't know about it, someone around the world never heard about it. Um, so educate us, educate the viewers. Uh, what is Juneteenth? 
Um, okay. And, and why we got to start back a little further than 1865. Africans came onto the English shores on the east coast of America in 1619. Now there were at, there were blacks in America in the southern regions earlier. They came in the 15th 16th century uh, with the Spanish and the French. We're speaking of those that came in uh, Fort Comfort, uh, let's say in in uh, August of 1619. They were not slaves. They came in as indentured servants. They were taken off of a off, off of a pirate ship, traded for food and water. They worked seven or ten years or whatever, and they were given their freedom. Slavery did not begin until another forty years later, when one man did not want to release his indentured servant. He went to court. And the judge gave him the, the power to keep this man in enslaved for the rest of his life. That is when slavery began. Now, so they were they were enslaved from 1660, 1661, all the way up to uh, 1861. This the, then you get into the Civil War. You had that you had the um, Civil War. You had the eleven states that, that dropped away from the United States and. These are the only states that the Emancipation Proclamation covered. Emancipation Proclamation did not cover the border states between the two sections. The Northerners had 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 slaves, but they were not really they were mechanized and not really known as slave states. The Southern states, there were eleven Southern states that pulled away from the Union. President Lincoln, in September of eighteen sixty two, wrote the Emancipation Proclamation telling them that if they did not return to the Union, they would take their, their property would be taken away from them, from the plantation owners. This took you up to December 31st, 1862, which gives you watch night. Watch night, people sat in the church waiting for midnight, January 1st, 1863, which gave them their freedom in Washington, D.C., and also gave them the recognition of, of freedom in, in the southern states. After that point, it then had to go to the Senate, which take, takes us to the 13th Amendment. It was voted because the president, the Emancipation Proclamation was just an order by the president. When it went to the Senate and the, and the House of Representatives, they voted on it, took it back to the Senate where uh, the president signed it into a law. Then the 13th Amendment became a law of freedom. Two and a half years later, Civil War was winding down. General was, was not, as a General Granger, Major General Granger, was en route to Texas-Mexico border to fight Maximilian. He had a number of ships. They had mixed rate they had u.s colored troops which had been in effect for about a year and a half two years for their freedom so if you like what you've seen so far don't forget to subscribe and check my courses online so you can go at online compi school and uh, subscribe here and hit the notification uh, so you get notified anytime you upload new videos um you have very interesting uh, uh content here so feel free to go ahead and watch whatever you like. You can also check my uh, courses on Udemy. This is one of my latest course, Solar System 101 course for all level. This is one of the- Hi everyone and welcome. Ever... I'm MD Jallo. I am an educator, a project manager, a data analyst with all about space and the long skills from public available information. Would you like to learn and refresh your knowledge about what is space? How big is space? about our solar system, about our own star, the sun, Kuiperbelt, the Earth cloud, beyond our solar system, with exoplanets and galaxies, planets, your planets, moon in our solar system, and then learn about eclipses, asteroids, comets. I will see you inside the course. Ready, set, let's go. So you can check that course if you like it. Um... To learn a little bit about our solar system and also I have other courses there um, you can see here um, some other courses the ultimate amazon leadership principle master class complete course on top 41 legit ideas to make money 
a brief beginner's guide to gaming, a brief introduction about America. That's a great course also. Starting a business in America as a foreigner. Okay, uh, that one also is a great course. Of course, the solar system course, one of the highest rated course right now in Udemy. Um, very hard. Um, make sure to check it out. All right, back to the video. And they had white Native American I tell you there were 10,000 black soldiers on these ships. They ran into a storm en route to Texas, Mexico. The ships went into Galveston. They got off the ships, and this is two and a half years after all the paperwork, and they say there are still people being held enslaved. Once they held them into once they found out they were enslaved, they went back and said, you will free these people or we will do something before we leave. General Granger had Major General Emery, or uh, Major Emery, General Order Number 3. They took it to the church called the Little Color Church, which is now known as Reedy Temple, Reedy, 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 Reedy Chapel in Galveston. They posted it on the door of Reedy Chapel and said, you all are free. You have been free for two and a half years. However, now you got to go back to the, to the plantations and work. Oh, you, you still, you're free, but you can't walk around without permission. So it was kind of shaky how they did that. And so you have, you, when you read into that, you will see the language that says, now they can hold you if it's a crime. Well, of course, we were not the ones writing the laws. So they have too many people still are in the in the prisons. Now it's a private a, a private entity, and and they're making money off of us anyway. There are people some some ran a, a number of people have spent that time just looking for their families because as I said the husbands, the wives, the children had been sold off. So now they're just they're trying to put their family together, but now they have learned June nineteenth, eighteen sixty five, that they are free, that. A lot of them had been shipped there by the by the plantation owners to because it was the farthest place from Washington. So they, you know, they they did not get the word, or they held they they kept them away from the word. Once they, as I say, once they were free, then they during that time, I mean, there were there were some in the northern pieces. They actually rented people out to the northern uh, businesses. To do the work, they, they, it wasn't just them raising cotton or raising tobacco. They were sending them north on on a lease, like you lease a house, you lease an apartment. They were sending families to the north to do work also. So these are some of the things that you they don't tell you. When when we went to when you went to school fifty years ago, they weren't teaching it. They're very teaching a little of it now. You know, they told you, yeah, there, there was there, there was slavery, but it doesn't click in. They were growing tobacco, they were growing cotton, but you still doesn't click in. Uh, so all the things that we had to show for 50 years ago in the late 40s, early 50s, you were look, you were still looking at Gone with the Wind uh, with, with Clark Gable, you know, and with Carol Burnett doing the comedy routine with, with the, the, the draperies out and pulling the draperies down and making an outfit. But you did not recognize the seriousness of what was done the freedoms that had been taken away from us, and say, uh, Roots is the first recognition, actually, slavery that told the story. And if you were alive at that time, if you were if you were born, uh, and, and and if even if your family did not have a TV, that well, what there was a week of total silence in the country. Uh, 9-11, If you think back, there was no you heard nothing after the bombs went off and the buildings fell. The street was perfectly silent after 9-11. We had the same experience when Roots came out because, as I say, every family in America was looking at the story. And if you did not have a TV, you found a friend that had a TV. And they all, for one week, everybody listened to the story of slavery. And that was the first real acknowledgement, the first real story that told you that there were Africans who sold who they 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 lost the war they they lost the battles they had the prisoners they sold them between themselves but again they were freeing each other after a certain amount of time then the caucasians came in and found out there were people available they started selling them to the caucasians who brought them over to the slave ships 1808 the, the government put the rule out that they could not sell people 
outside the country, but it did not stop them from breeding us inside. That, that we were given to husbands when women got married. That was they would give them. They would give them china, a cow, some dishes, and two or three slaves or whatever they needed. That they, when they died, you looked at you saw the same thing in the will. You saw that uh, the seamstress was going to be sent to the daughter, and the carpenter uh, and the shoesmith was going to be sent to the son. They just passed us along like they did any other family treasure. So, you know, those are things that we, that we did not learn. I did not know about Juneteenth until 20 years ago. So you can teach an old dog new tricks. I knew nothing, but I have, I've had good teachers in the last 20 years. I have learned the history of the, of the community. And our flag is red, white, and blue. As you can see back there, it is right. a red, white, and blue flag, same as the American flag, because we are Americans. We built this country. We made the, most of the inventions during that time because we did the work. Right. We had to make it easy for ourselves. The only way we could make it easy was to create things. But because they did not allow us to learn to read, we were not allowed to write, we did not have churches. They incorporated and, and had got the copyrights on all the inventions and they took the profits. The only way the black people coming up are the, uh, I won't say the only way, the majority of the way black people gained anything over the years was insurance. When you, you, you bought insurance, you died, your family had some money. You were not, you, you had very, you had very few cases of a copyright that was in your name until later. So now, you know, but now when you look back, you find out that we invented the stoplight, we invented the oil on the trains, how how to how to do the 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 local the lubrication of the train wheels. We did there are so many inventions, and you know you can find the books in the libraries that will tell you these stories. Right. So th this is some of the stuff that we're now investigating. We're now incorporating. We are now teaching people. As but again, it is verified first through newspapers articles, books that were written in at, at that time for verification. We just don't take someone's word that this is what happened. We if you if we tell you something, we can we can show you a book or some printed material that will verify what we're telling you. So you uh, you started that was great. You started in 1619, um, went through slavery uh, to the civil uh, civil war. You talked about the Emancipation Proclamation, the Thirteen Amendment, um, and then uh, all the way to June um, 19, 1865. Um, so, is that uh, in, after you know two and a half years after the Thirteen Amendment, and then when the the last this this slave was freed in Texas, was that the last people who were enslaved in America at that time? Like after As I that, say, the right. the the treaties written in the Western Territory in June 14th, 1866, when they were signed, was officially the last piece of paperwork. However, in small towns, people were still being held enslaved for years afterwards. Wow. It, it, June 19th is a day we recognize because across the country, there we didn't have the communications, we didn't have the internet, we didn't have the telephone. So they were able to hold people under their control after that date. It wow. is not the last date. Wow. Wow. Yeah, thank you for clarifying that um, the struggle was still continuing. Um, so take me from 1865 up to up to in the 90s, the 1960s, let's say 100 years later, right? Um, okay. So, 1920s, so we went from 18... they, they traveled from the South because right. the first thing they tried to do was put the families back together. Then they traveled north, to the, they migrated to the north, but you still don't always, when they left, they did not tell the stories, they did not look back. Uh, doing genealogy, my question was, how did my family get from Tennessee, Mississippi to Illinois? Mm -hmm. And they said, well, that's when the, slate, when the family cousins got killed, when they were lynched. And I'm like, never heard the story. How did I found out another cousin I do in genealogy found that in August 31st, September 1st, 1894, 30 years later, they were 
there were six family members, cousins, brothers, cousins, brother-in-laws. They were arrested by the sheriff. They supposedly missed the train to take them to the next city. So they put them on a wagon. They drove them through a dark area on the wagon. The sheriff and, and his deputy jumped off the ship, off the wagon, and a crowd came out and shot him. They shot my cousin's great-great-grandfather so bad he was nearly decapitated. His head was hanging. There were the, the wagon was full of bullet holes. And, and so they, ki they killed all six of them. They all had large families. Uh, and some went to Illinois. Some went to uh, St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, some Chicago, some some Sandusky in Lower Illinois, some went to Georgia. They just spread the names. They some some took the some kept the name that they had been using as slaves. Others uh, changed their names entirely. Then they they in in 1890 the census record. Now 1860 they did not have a black person's name on the census. They wow. were they just they had a slave record. And all it said was man, 35, shoemaker. It did not give you his name. It did not tell you how many people above his name or below his name was his wife, his children, or whatever. It just said 35-year-old man, 32-year-old woman, 12-year-old. Tw so you, you, you had no record. So 1860, no record. 1870, five years after, after the slavery was supposedly ended, now you start seeing... Amos, Amos had a wife named Lucinda. Amos was was uh, had been a slave was had been free for so many years. He was approximately forty five years old. So now you can figure out approximately when he was born, but you still really did not necessarily know where he was born. Found out that in addition to the wife, there were eleven other people in the house. You think that. It, that they're all families, they may or may not have been, because they may have all just came off the same plantation, shared the same last name. They may have just all been living together because that was the easiest thing to do. Now, they're sharecroppers because of 1865. They've got their freedom, and they start spreading out slowly. As I say, some stayed in the South as farmers, but they were sharecroppers and had to pay part of their, their food back to, to, the slate, to, the, to the plantation owner. Uh, we did have in the 1870s, 1880s, we did have black uh, elected officials. You don't hear about that during that period. They were teachers. They were senators. And then slowly they changed the laws in such a way that you could not be, you could not be an elected official. Some went to the north. Um, during the slavery times, you heard about the Underground Railroad that ran to, 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 to Canada. But there were two underground railroads. There was an underground railroad that went across the South. And you don't hear about it going across Texas into Texaco, Maryland. You don't hear about John Horse, an Indian uh, Native American who, who led the, the, the folks from Georgia uh, over to, uh, through Florida. And they fought off the people that were trying to, to, to enslave them. So that's another story you don't hear. Uh, again, as I say, we became the inventors when they went to Chicago. They took the news on the trains with them. The conductors on the trains would carry the newspapers, uh, the Memphis paper to the north, the Chicago paper uh, to the south, which was the De Chicago Defender. They would carry them on under, they would hide them on the train. Sometimes they would hide people that were, that were running from uh, the people in the south. They would carry them on the train, and this is how the news passed from the north to the south. During genealogy, I pulled up copies of the Chicago Defender, and I read all the little social columns. And it you would read, Cousin Albert is now in Chicago. He came to St. Louis to see his sister, who was, who was coming in from, from whatever city she came in. They were there for, for their niece's wet wedding in such and such a town. And I was able to put together the names and, and family connections. Uh, like I said, it was about, about 40 years I was able to put together that away. And this is how, you know, this is one of the ways that we were able to connect the families. Eventually, I ended up with about 2,700 names. 
that I had tracked down across the country over the years. My grandfather, they changed names. My grandfather's name went from Albert D to Albert to Alfred, back to Albert again. And now the 1890, they destroyed, accidentally, supposedly, all the census records or the majority of the census records. So from 1880 to 1900, we lost a generation, especially if it was a woman who got married and changed her name. She could, if she was born at, in 1881, and by the time and you know she got married in in, in 1895, now you're in, in 1900, you have no record of her because they threw away, they burned the records. So those are some of the things that you know we 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 need to do for genealogy. Now you've got the DNA test. But now the DNA test is giving you a different story because, again, the plantation owner raped the women without knowing who. Sometimes they were saying that this is your child, but it was a plantation owner's child. And now you're finding out two generations later that you're not all Nigerian, that you're not all Ghana, that you that you have no Native American blood, that you're 51 percent Russian Jew. Or or, or 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 something else that you have no idea because, there, you know, it was just, well, what is it? Mother's baby, daddy's maybe. That was the bottom line. You, you really did not, you know, you took the word of what you heard. The names were, were changed because the census re records were, the uh, takers were illiterate. So your family name changed. You know, you started off as, as Bond Slater, Barn Slater, Bum Slater. The spelling changes from two T's to two D's. You know, A becomes a U. So you, you've got to try to follow the family tree and find out who's next door to each other to find your family that way. You know, these are all the things that we need to teach those people who do want to know their family histories. Ancestry does pretty good. And uh, I believe the NAACP a couple a few years ago, they, they did a trip to Africa and took them to to show them where they where they actually entered the the slave to, uh, the the ships coming over to America, uh, but the majority again they went to South America. We did not get the majority of the people that were held enslaved. You know that's another part of the story. So you don't really know exactly where your family was at. A lot of them came in through South Carolina, but not. And it's a tedious job, but somebody's got to do it. Meanwhile, yeah. again, we commemorate the trauma of slavery, but we celebrate the freedom that came after June 19th, 1865. Wow. So <laughs> uh, after June 19th, then we went to two world war, uh, world war one, world war two. Then we end up with the civil right, civil right movement in the 1960s. Well, now you, you're going into world one, world war two, right. world war one, 1914, 1915. You have the soldiers coming back from Europe. In Europe, they had they did not have problems. They did not have issues. Mm -hmm. They come here. They can, they're back to be almost to back to slavery. They don't, they cannot get jobs. They cannot sit on, on the front of the bus. They got to go to the back of the bus. So now you've got the riots of 1917 and 1919. There were riots across the country where they weren't going to take it anymore. Uh, in Illinois, 1919, a young man was in Lake Michigan swimming. So, um, so you were talking about uh, World War One, uh, up to World War Two, um, okay. then up to the 1960s. Um, so, um, any uh, thought on 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 those timeline? Okay, 1919, Chicago had a race riot. Young man who did not see an invisible line in the water swam to the wrong part of Lake Michigan. He was he was black. He was he was they threw stones at him. He was in the water. He was they would not the whites on the other side of this invisible line threw rocks and stones and would not allow him to return to his side, would not allow him to turn return to the beach, and he died. He drowned. When that happened, riot broke out in Chicago. Uh, stockyard ends, lakefront, uh, two communities. And that is one of about 
40 riots that took place during the 1917-1919. So going forward from there, 1944, you will find some of the United States color uh, United States color troops w had evolved by then into the Buffalo Soldiers, and while they were they were working uh, the Buffalo Soldiers. Now this takes I, I I doubled back a little bit. Buffalo Soldiers were the first park rangers in the Western Territory. They were uh, the first firefighters in, in the forest, fires out in the Western territories. So now that you come up to 1944, these black soldiers had now evolved into the Army Engineers Unit and they were in Alaska mm. and they built a, a, a bridge in Alaska in the, in the 40s. And they were disbanded a few years later. So. They had pretty much a close to a hundred. They had about a ninety-year period of the Buffalo Soldiers, the Black Soldiers, and then they were eventually, uh, nineteen forty-eight, I believe, were eventually in, incorporated into the regular Army units. And February first, there is a there was a Freedom Day, uh, signed by one of the President Roosevelts, that declared Freedom Day. Coming forward, we have. Um, you have Black History Month week, and then you come into Black History Month. Carter G. Woodson and that, and then uh, uh, Mr. Richard took it to an entire month, and he came forward. So we're up to the uh, '60s. You're looking at these the social world, um, social injustice, the Martin Luther Kings, the Dr. Abernathy's, and they did have. The March on Washington was wrapped around June 19th in the 60s. So they brought that in into, into fruition and uh, coming forward from then. Now, that is civil rights. Juneteenth is actually human rights. So they, they work together, but they're not necessarily the same thing. And again, the jobs start increasing. Women start getting a little bit more power in, in their work. And let's say Dr. King was killed. Robert Kennedy was killed. John Kennedy. It, it, was, it, was, a, it was a rough time in, 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 our, in our period there. Juneteenth kind of died down between in the 20s and 30s. They, they, they had come up to the north, they were in the mechanized world, they were off the farms, and they did not recognize Juneteenth as much until you get up to the civil rights era, civil rights march, and then we come, that's the 60s. You come forward to 1994, and we're in New Orleans. New Orleans, we're there, there's a group of Juneteenth advocates from across the country. Uh, they had a meeting. And from that, in 1994, 1995, evolved my organization, National Juneteenth Observance Foundation, with Reverend Ronald v uh, Myers, Ronald V. Myers, Senior MD, uh, was, was elected the president of the NJOF. And from that point forward, he, well, let me go give you a little of his background. Doc was born in yeah. Chicago. Mm -hmm. went to went to Milwaukee for education got his music degree his medical degree and at that time he was approached by a young man from out of Mississippi who said we need you in the south and doc says when i get my diploma i will be there and one day he looked up and here comes doc in his car with all his earthly possessions in it saying i'm here and doc moved into Belzona Mississippi which is where he stayed until his death in 2018. Now, Doc traveled the country. He promoted not only Juneteenth. Before that, he was uh, promoting, I believe it was the catfish workers. They're one, one of the fish groups. He, he was promoting that. He had a baseball team. He had three medical clinics. And you can look him up on Wikipedia for, for more concise information because it's been a while since I've read all of it. I help, helped him write it, actually. We did it. The, most of what you see on Wikipedia, Doc and I wrote up in 2010. Uh, there was more to the article. However, they said that the person who wrote the article was too close to Doc Myers, and they cut half of it or two-thirds of it. But it's there is a recognition of Dr. Myers there, 
And then he started traveling uh, across the country. Uh, in the 2000s, he started going from state to state promoting Juneteenth. He did awards for the uh, musicians of the time period. Uh, by the time I got involved, 2005, to he started coming here and we did speeches for Martin Luther King Day. We did, we did our, our first uh, outdoor event in 2010. Quite frankly, and, and, we, and the, we, start, we started off in the library in a meeting room. When we got to the park that summer, there were more people playing instruments under the tree than was outdoors. It was just too hot. So for the next year, we started planning things inside the library. And over the years, we had our first event in the library about 2011, the year that we got the, the first state uh, legislation. 2011, we were in the lobby of the library theater. And a couple of years later, we finally graduated to the theater indoors. And that's where we've been ever since. Now, since that time, the last time Doc was supposed to come out here, he called from the basement of the airport in Oklahoma saying, we're in the basement, and there's a hurricane coming across, so I'm not going to make it today. And that was the last chance we had of Doc coming to Cal uh, to Nevada from California. He would start in California, come to Vegas uh, first week of June, and work his way across the country to Washington, D.C. by, by Juneteenth, where he would have uh, an annual press prayer breakfast at the, in the halls of Congress to, to s tell them about Juneteenth. So he is the one that act, that went to the senators, went to the House of Representatives, and tried to find out why we had not gotten a Juneteenth holiday in 20 years. And they okay. said, well, it's a Texas holiday, but it's not. He was able to, once we knew where we were going, he was able to take each state of the people that were, were in opposition and show them the connection between Juneteenth and their state. So we have uh, Tulsa, you know, say the black states in the Western territories of Tulsa. We, we pointed out that Granger, General Granger, when, when the war was over, he retired to Kentucky. The U.S. colored troops came out of Indiana, Illinois, New York, Pennsylvania, and so on and so forth. Steve was able to actually take the time to research and back up his story and sell each one of them their connection to the Juneteenth movement, the freedom movement, enslavement, freedom. In 2020, we were one vote short of a unanimous vote, and that was because the senator in Wisconsin did not vote. He voted against us. In the meantime, we collected 1.5 million signatures on, a, uh, on petitions for Juneteenth. Steve and Miss Opal took the took these um, petitions to the, to the Congress and presented it. I believe it was October of twenty twenty, February twenty twenty one. They made another presentation to the Senate to the House, and norm normally when you get a state bi a bill passed, the house it goes through the Assembly first or through the, through the House of Representatives, rather. They, put, they started off, and then they sent it to the Senate for approval. In this case, Juneteenth was passed as a no-findings bill. Usually you will, see, you will have to come up with reasons for Juneteenth being a holiday. Well, in this case, Steve was able to tell them, if you go across the board of all the states, only three states or four states are left that do not have legislation. They agreed with him. The Senate placed the bill on the floor first. They voted unanimously, uh, the 100 votes, and then the, the House of Representatives came in with 415 votes. And so that Juneteenth passed. Now, at the time, we had been told that we get could get the bill passed. The president, go, he was overseas at the time. He was coming from Stockholm or Sweden, and he would go to Galveston to sign the bill. He didn't do it. He came back to the White House. Four o'clock, three o'clock in the morning on June 17th, they used a system that former President Trump had set up to, so he could get all of his messages out. 
And they sent a message out to all federal employees that says, at 3, at 3 p.m. this afternoon, the president will be signing the Juneteenth bill in Washington. Most of the representatives of the Juneteenth nation who had been looking forward to this did not have time to get there. In fact, most of them did not get the message, including Steve Williams. He had just left Vegas with a, a program here. He had been talking to people. They said, oh, it's going to be in a few days in Galveston. He went to sleep. And when he woke up, he got the message. Uh, you've only got a couple of hours to get to the White House because he's signing the bill this afternoon. Wow. And that's how And Miss Opal, they woke her up. Miss Opal was 95, 96 years old. They woke her up. They got her on a plane. So she made it to the table. Steve did not. Wow. And that's how the bill got sold. The message that went out to all the federal employees was, you have tomorrow off. The president is making tomorrow the recognition of Juneteenth, and you don't have to come to work. So here comes Juneteenth. Everybody that was looking for Juneteenth mail, we had flags in the mail, T-shirts. They get to the post office. The post office is closed because we got them a holiday. <laughs> Oh, uh, what a story! What a story! Um, yes, uh, that, that and and it's pretty much the same thing now. Uh, yeah. I got a call two days ago. Uh, the the governor signing the bill. They, well, they said first the governor will be signing the bill this week, and then I get a text that when I wake up that says he will be in Carson City signing the bill at three o'clock. You will have your Juneteenth state holiday, and it was a repeat. It was one of those party. last minute things. We were not able, I was not able to get there, but I was able to make it in 2011 when Governor Sandoval signed the bill uh, for the first piece of Juneteenth legislation. Wow. So what keep you ho hopeful? What are, um, let me phrase it this way. What are some of the advancements since the civil rights era? Things that you can point out and say, hey, these are, these are progress that we made and what do you think about the future um, of this fight for freedom? And uh, like uh, like uh, Nelson Mandela used to say, the long walk to freedom, you know, is, is not over yet. <laughs> it's been a long road, and now the road leads to education. Again, Juneteenth is, a, is not necessarily a civil rights issue, but a social rights issue. Right. So we're working to make sure people get registered to vote. Uh, they don't have to be told about the brown bag to see if they, if they were allowed to vote. They don't have to pay a poll tax. We want to make sure people know that they have the right and the expectation that they will use that right to register to vote, not vote for any particular party. Read both sides of the issue. Find out who the best person is for the job and vote for them. We do not support any any type we don't support um a candidate we support the truth so we say you know examine what you're doing make a decision but if nothing else make a vote let your voice be heard going forward of course as I said we had politicians in the 1870s a hundred years later we we got we started getting them back in office again uh we still have redlining with where people cannot get a lease or a home in, in certain areas we still have states where after dark you don't want to be caught in those states you still have idiots that are up on the bridges dropping rocks on cars if they see them coming and they don't look like them they will throw a rock at them and, and drop boulders through the through the uh, windshield so some things have not changed. You've got people get a, a knee in their back and, and for, for selling a cigarette or, or for standing on the corner or for walking from the grocery store because they don't think they look right. You've got the Arbery family where he was, he was out jogging and they didn't think he belonged, so they chased him and they shot him in the back. Uh, so those are things we, we, we really got that have not changed. And with the last administration... They've come out from under the rocks. They they never left, but they are more. They're, they're nowadays January sixth. You know they're they're out there back out in the open in out of the white sheets. Uh, but again, Juneteenth is a unifier. We're trying to bring the Republicans and the Democrats together 
We are working with the NAACP and, and other organizations that have been out there for, forever. Uh, in fact, I will be speaking at one of the NAACP events this, this coming weekend. We help each other now. There's another Juneteenth organization here in Las Vegas, Juneteenth Festival, that Diane Pollard. They tried to keep us separated. And finally, Diane and I, I had a chance to sit down and have a lunch. And so now when they call and say, Diane is upset with you, I pick up a telephone and say, what's the problem? She always says, there's no problem. They're just trying, they're trying to break us up. So now Diane will be having her event with 5,000 people. And I have my smaller events and my legislations. My events are normally 400 people. She does one 5,000 and I do 10, 400. So we're still in the same arena. Uh, I, I do the videos. I, I, I go out and speak to people. I, I pass out information. We have the Facebook Juneteenth Directors and Planners page. We have the Juneteenth Celebrations page. We have JuneteenthNevada.org, National-Juneteenth.org. We have a weekly call where we, where we invite people from across the country. And that is at uh, 720-453-2464. 12 noon central time. You're welcome to come in, listen, learn, ask questions. We have um, a planning group for, well, every year we do we do an event, uh, a national event for, for our directors and planners. So on Mondays, we have a meeting where we're planning this. On Tuesday, we have an economics group that meets. We have a Miss Juneteenth group that meets. On Wednesday, the education and um calendar group meets we have a we have a legislative coin group this meeting we are working on a a coin that that should be out in a couple of years because it takes that long to turn things around we have a juneteenth stamp and planning we just finished off shove off day shove off day may 25th we had reenactors and speakers in uh, fort comfort virginia now known as hopewell virginia that is where the ships left on their way to the Texas-Mexico border and stopping off at, at, at Galveston. So we had a program there May 25th of, of this year uh, in recognition of what, the, and that's, a, that's an annual. It is in partnership with the Park Service Administration and who they are also in charge of the White House. And because of that, we have moved forward. We will be at the White House on the ellipse, June nineteenth, with an, with our Wave of Freedom program. All things Juneteenth is what we say. We we connect all the dots. We connect the people. We connect the messages and go forward, and and, and try to tie in everything that you need to know about our history. Again, we are Americans. We are Americans of African descent. Our flag is red, white, and blue. The red goes on the blood on the bottom of the flag when you hang it to represent the blood that we shed. We were the inventors. We recognize every year. We move forward. Education for the families, for the children. Another program we had here in Vegas that we've got to bring back is um, Soul Soul City Wi Fi. We we're presenting um, uh, free internet service to the members of the community. We're going to be expanding that outward, but that's where we did that during COVID, where, as I say, Steve is an internet technician, an engineer. He actually came out during COVID, probably in some cases, the only person on the plane, other than, than the people that were working the plane, <laughs> mask, sunglasses, big hat, rubber gloves. He had the whole thing, but he would, he came out here for two years and he climbed the ladder to the rooftops and installed uh, equipment to give service to the West Side community. So that will be coming back. We have Juneteenth.tv, which is just coming out of beta. We've been testing it, and it will have eight channels of programming, eight channels of, of Juneteenth stories, eight channels where we can tell our history, the American history, and put it out there and go forward. That's a great idea. Juneteenth.tv. That's a great idea. You also have the that uh, web web conference, Uber conference slash. We have Juneteenth. Uber conference. That's our conference line. And as I say, we have conference calls every evening between five and six, depending on uh, which uh, 
five and six Pacific, depending on which organization or which membership you belong to. Uh, and, and it is available to our directors. So if the person in, in Ohio or Indiana or Kansas, if one of, one of our directors needed to set up a meeting, uh, they contact me and we, we will give them the use of, of our Uber line so they can they can set up their meetings and they can do their planning. Actually, there are other Juneteenth. We have Miss Juneteenth. We have Miss Juneteenth on, on the Internet, on Facebook. We have a National Miss Juneteenth page and a Juneteenth Nevada page. Uh, so you can go with all of those. Uh, we pass the information on. That is the Uber line that you're showing there. And we, we normally, we send out 400 invitations every week. Uh, if they will contact me at 888-509-6563, uh, extension 701 with questions, they can call me. If they just want to get on the mailing list, they can send an email to join, J-O-I-N at national-juneteenth.org. Put their name, email, and a phone number. We will put them on the listing. Uh, they will get an agenda on Friday nights for the Saturday call. They will get a reminder call on Saturday morning to to join us. Calls are normally 90 minutes to two hours long. So for someone out there, um, what's your advice for young people, for people around the world, you know? <laughs> Keep reading. Read multiple versions. And if you have a question, if, if it does not make sense, call me. Right. Which, you know, I may not have all the answers, but I have faith that we have enough people within the Juneteenth Nation. I can get you an answer. We can get an answer. We we, we love working with people. We want to make sure they tell us the, the, the real story. Read, listen, ask questions. And genealogy, go with the oldest person in the family and, and it's before you lose them and get the, as much information about the family from them and write it down. There are... Um, there's software on the internet. When I started, everything was paper and pencil. There was no internet. You yeah. now have Ancestry. You've got uh, Mormons. They have an uh, internet site that's got, you can look up the, the census records. You can follow some of those trails and get information. You have your DNA test. If, if you know, not everybody believes in DNA, but it's out there. So right. find the tools that you can use. Study your family study the history and when you find the history don't keep it to yourself share yeah. it with others yeah. pass it on post it if you get an email from us send it on to your friends send it on to your mailing list of what you've got if if you're 14 to 18 young lady in one of our states try out for miss uh miss Juneteenth scholarship program it's not a bathing suit pro show it's you have you learned the, the three documents of freedom: Emancipation Proclamation, the Thirteenth Amendment, and General Order Number Three. You're not you don't have to memorize, it, but we teach them what it is, and we teach them to read and uh, for understanding. And when they that's one of the things they have they have to do a five hundred word essay. They have to um, have an entrepreneurial skill of some type that they can talk about. They uh, nationally, they're going to be asking for 72 hours of community service, working hospitals, helping pack lunches or whatever, and and have that, you know, have a teacher mention that, give, give them a statement, give them a reference, and be able to explain to anyone about the three documents of freedom and the Juneteenth flag, what the colors mean, the, the horizon and, and the blood, that we earned our freedom. We did, it was not given to us. It was, it was earned by our ancestors, by our forefathers to go forward and again, tell the story of Juneteenth, tell the story of history, our history, our American history. Yes, education is so important. One of my favorite quotes from Nelson Mandela when he said, Education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. Uh, what you're doing is so important out there. I wanted to have your thought about, uh, you know, what happened in South Africa, about apartheid. And also after apartheid, they had what they call a truth and reconciliation commission. Like they put in place a, a very good commission to have that reconciliation. Be, you know, people were, you know, people come in the commission to, to talk, to ask forgiveness, to re reconcile, you know, 
like you said, to, to teach love, to what's your thought on that? Is that something that can happen in the, in the United States, like a Truth and Reconciliation Commission? It may not happen in our lifetime, just like reparations may not happen in our lifetime, but I do believe they will happen. Yeah. I think we're going to get it. It's just, like I said, we got to teach the kids. We got to go back and teach the parents, the grandparents. Somewhere in there, there is someone who, you know, who is going to be able to pull it all together. So, you know, they say you, about abortion, you never know who you might be killing. You might have the one person that will have some answers. Personally, I don't, I don't, I mean, I believe in the woman's right to do what she wants. Right. But I would think twice before I did this. There, there are families out there that want their children, want babies. Let them be adopted. I went to the funeral today, and the gentleman who passed away was a Buffalo soldier. He was going to be 80 years old this year. And I just found out today that he was adopted. His mother had abandoned him at birth. He, had no, he hadn't told anybody. He just came out after his death that he had been abandoned, he had been uh, adopted when he was a few days old. He built his own life. As the minister said at the service, he was like Johnny Appleseed. He, wherever he went, he, he dropped the seeds of freedom, of, of family, of love. And, and we go forward with that. And he loved everyone. He, he supported everyone. Somewhere in there, there, there's others like him who will make you feel that you belong no matter what has happened to you, no matter where you're going, no matter how bad your life has been. You're, th there's somebody out there for you that will tell you and help you go forward. And John John was one of those people, and we're going to miss him tremendously. He was the vice president of the Juneteenth, or I mean, not Juneteenth, but the Buffalo Soldiers out here. Uh, like I said, so it may not happen in their lifetime, but it's going to oh. happen. Yeah, I'm so sorry for to hear that. My thoughts and prayers to his family. Listen, uh, thank you so much for what you're doing. Thank you for educating me. You know, um, I learn a lot, educating my viewers and uh, people around the world. So you, we went from 1619 to the slave slavery era, to the Civil War, and uh, we talked about the three documents of freedom: the Emancipation Proclamation, the Thirteen Amendment, and the General Order Number Three. Personally, I I didn't know about the General Order Number Three, so that's that's really that's so that was great. And then we went to the two World War, World War One, World War Two, the Civil Rights Era, um, to 1994 to 2000, to our modern time with all the federal holidays, the state holidays, um, and uh, everything happening around June 10 and. Uh, um, the fight for freedom, the, for love, for equality, inclusion. Um, yeah, thank you so much for being here. Um, any last thoughts? Opportunity, and actually, there's the there's the Tuskegee Airmen to look into. Yeah. There's a triple the triple uh, nickels, which was another group of Army veterans. There was the women uh, unit of six triple eight. They mm -hmm. were the women in in the in the World War Two. There was a two-year backlog of mail that had not been delivered, and they cleaned it up in three months. And they got a gold medal the first of last year. And Miss Lena King, who was one of those women, is just made her 100th birthday two months ago. She is here in Vegas. Tyler Perry came out for her birthday. And from my understanding, he is doing a movie on the 6888 postal service of, of, of the women, women's unit. So there's, there's more stories, uh, but I know we were limited time, but there's so many more. Just as I say, keep reading, keep asking questions. That's so powerful. Keep reading, keep asking questions, educate yourself. Uh, any last thoughts you want to add in? All things Juneteenth. <laughs> All things Juneteenth. That's, yes, a, that's a great ending. Thanks so much for being here. And I hope we can do this again next time. Um, and uh, yeah, have a, have a good one. Bye-bye.